So our goal for this workshop is to understand the difference between cash price, futures, and basis, and to really you know, feel like we have a really good grip on those concepts. I and mean, those three concepts are, are really crucial to kind of any sort of marketing plan. Even if you're just selling in the cash market, it's really important, I would say, that you understand kind of how that cash price is being created. So, um, so after, kind of after we really develop um, a really good understanding of cash price, future price, and basis, we're gonna start introducing uh, a few basic grain pricing tools. Um, so talking about forward contracts, hedging, which is gonna be our main focus tonight, uh, really talking a lot about, about hedging and, and how it works and why it works and how we can use it, uh, options and minimum price contracts. Um, so options and minimum price contracts will mostly be our focus next week, so not tonight. And then the kind of the last, the last part of our goal is to really help everyone here develop kind of the tools to, to work with someone else to develop a marketing plan. So, so this workshop is not going to necessarily kind of give you everything you, that you need to know to, to sit down it, this March and, and write down a marketing plan, but hopefully it kind of spurs some interest in, in these tools and how you can use these tools in your operations, um, as well as kind of develop some confidence so that when you're talking with your merchandiser or talking with someone at an elevator um, and you hear these things thrown around, you're not kind of left in the dark, but you're like, hey, you know, I know, I know what that is. Um, and, you know, maybe that's something that's going to work for me. So what are we going to talk about tonight? What's the cash market? So <laughs> probably almost 99% of people on this call know what the cash market is, uh, but this is kind of just where we're going to start. We're going to talk about what's the futures market. And, and importantly, what's the relationship between the cash market and the futures market? And, and why does it matter that they're so correlated and closely related? What's basis? Uh, what determines basis? A little bit about how we can forecast basis. Um, and then how, how can we use basis um, when we're making hedges? And what is a hedge? Um, a little bit later tonight, I'm going to talk about thinking about when we lift a hedge. Um, and so to do that, I'm gonna introduce the concept of a break-even basis um, and talk about what we do when we're below break-even basis and what we do when we're above break-even basis. So just to give kind of an appetizer of next week, I'm gonna introduce um, a quadrant pricing tool. So this kind of tells you whether the futures are strengthening or weakening, if basis is strengthening or weakening. Um, what sort of tools should we be looking to use? So that's, that's next week. Um, so today I'm gonna kind of just introduce some of the important concepts. And then next week we're gonna get into kind of given some forecasts about where the market's going, what sort of tools should you be looking to employ? Um, so I'm gonna just touch on hedge store app contracts briefly tonight. Uh, next week we'll do kind of more of a deep dive with more examples about how to use those contracts. Um, as well as basis contracts. And probably we'll get to options. If not, that will be kind of punted to the third week of the workshop. So hopefully by now I've really convinced everyone um, that this is really gonna be um, a basics workshop. Um, and as Claire mentioned, that means there's no dumb questions. Every question is fair game. Um, and we'll, we'll try and do our best to get you an answer. Um, if you think of a question after the workshop, um, feel free to, to send me an email. Um, and that, that goes, if you asked a question in the workshop, got an answer that you didn't quite understand, um, email is also a good tool to use to kind of follow up on that. All right, so now we're gonna kind of dive straight ahead into, into our content. So this is kind of just a really simple equation that I want us to have in our minds when we think about grain pricing. So the, the cash price that we see when you go to your local elevator and you see a cash price, that depends on the futures price and then the basis. And I have basis in red there because normally in Michigan, we're talking about a negative basis. So all three of these prices vary over time. Um, so, you know, there's today's cash price and it's going to be different tomorrow. Um, and then for a futures price, and we'll talk more about kind of the different futures contracts, those are always fluctuating up and down um, as is basis. So, so these things are not static, they're always changing. Um, and that's important because we can potentially take advantage of those changes 
um, to get ourselves the best price. So basis depends on location um, and the futures price doesn't sort of. So, you know, there's kind of a, an, a blank space for there should be the follow up where the, the futures price is, we can think about that as a world price. That's not going to depend on location. So then the cash price is, is these two things. And this is, this is by definition, right? Because we define basis as the difference between the cash price and the futures price. So kind of no matter what they are, that's the basis fills in the gap. And the reason that this equation is, is so, I think, powerful for brain marketing is that we don't have to lock in these prices at the same time. So when we think about our ultimate net cash price that we want, uh, we can lock in a futures price at a different time than we lock in our basis. So because these are always varying over time, um, that gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot of power in terms of getting um, a price that we want and, and reducing our risk. So I'll, I'll touch on this more later, but kind of, I, I want everyone to always be thinking about these as two decisions, right? So you never just say, you know, I like the cash price, I'm gonna sell for the cash price. It's, it's two decisions. It's I like the futures price and I like my basis. Um, and because I like both, that means I like the cash price. So what's the cash market? It's just an agreed upon price for immediate delivery. So um, you take it to your local elevator and you just sell your grain to them right then. So no, no commitment to deliver a specific amount. Um, so the amounts can vary you kind of just show up with the grain. Um, so I should have mentioned this at the beginning. This is really, um, this workshop in general is really targeted at kind of some of the, the major commodities, um, the major crop, crop commodities in Michigan of corn, soy, and wheat. Um, so these are, these are commodities that, that have a futures market for them. Um, and a, a lot of my examples um, will be, be corn with a, a few soy and wheat examples thrown in. But, the principles kind of behind them are, are the same, I would say, kind of regardless of if you're talking about corn, soy, or wheat. So advantages of the, the cash market, you can get cash quickly. So if you have bills coming due and you know you need funds to pay them, um, the cash market is going to allow you to do that, you know, assuming you have you have grain to sell. Um, and it's simple. And so I think that's why a lot of people kind of default to the cash market and kind of selling maybe some of their grain in the cash market every month um, because, because it's easy and because it's straightforward. Um, what's the futures price? So we really want to think about this as, as the world price. So um, kind of anything that affects the demand or the supply of grain anywhere in the world is going to be filtering into this price. So you know, if there's weather events going on, you know, 5,000 miles away in Russia, um, that's going to affect the futures price. Um, so this is really kind of aggregating all of the signals. Um, and we'll talk more about how, how markets do that in, in a few slides. Um, so this, this is, I think, something that, whoops, this is something that certainly I know can trick up at least my students when I've, I've TA'd classes um, for this before, um, is that there's kind of two time periods to keep in your mind for a futures price. So there's the time that you're looking at the price. And then there's also, you know, what futures price is it? Is this a corn futures contract? Is this a July futures contract? Um, so there's, you know, different months of the year that you can have a, a futures contract. Um, and so you need to know which contract you're talking about. It's, it's kind of not just enough to say like, oh, that's a futures price. Um, you know, maybe they're talking about the most, the, the most, sorry, the most nearby one, the next month that's coming up, um, but maybe not. So you sort of, you need more specificity when you're talking about what futures price. So you have a specific time period you're looking at the price and you have a specific contract um, that you're talking about. So we're gonna get to basis later, but for now I'm gonna talk a lot more about, about futures. So what's a futures contract? This is an obligation to buy or sell a fixed quantity of a well-defined commodity at some point in the future. So, so what's a well-defined commodity? So typically we think of commodities are as things that kind of we grow or kind of come out of the ground. So, you know, silver is a commodity, lumber is a commodity. And a key 
characteristic of a commodity is that my commodity is just as good as your commodity. So we don't have to kind of, you know, someone doesn't need to come in and evaluate, you know, is, is this, is the, is the gold I'm selling you as good as the gold that someone down the street is selling? You know, gold is gold. And this, by the same logic, number two yellow corn is number two yellow corn. So that's, that's a key characteristic of a commodity is that it can kind of, we can all pile our commodity in a, in a big pile. Um, and it doesn't matter which came from where, because it's all the same. And that, that really allows for the creation of a, of a futures market. So when we talk about a futures price, we're talking about the price that goes along with this contract. So, so because there's an obligation to buy or sell, um, the futures price is the price that 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 obligation is taken over at. So I'm going to say, you know, I agree to buy X amount of corn at this date, at this place, for this price. And futures exchanges are places where we can centralize all these transactions. Um, that's going to make information dissemination a lot easier. So this is bringing together buyers and sellers. So. I, I have a few of these uh, videos kind of sprinkled um, throughout the talk. Um, so these are put by the, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is the big, the big futures market. Um, so now I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm a little wary of how the transition is gonna, gonna go, but we're gonna try and switch over to the video and hopefully everyone will be able to see it and then hear it. So I'm gonna stop share for just a second while I do this. Today's futures markets are technologically sophisticated global marketplaces trading at high speeds on electronic platforms around the globe nearly 24 hours a day. But did you know that the roots of futures trading trace back to Greek and Phoenician merchants who carried their goods for sale around the known world, opening deep and lasting global interconnections based on trade? Global commerce now does its price discovery in our modern futures markets, which first agriculture industry, where seasonality and supply and demand fluctuations could lead to repeated gluts and shortages of products, and in turn lead to chaotic fluctuations in price. Early hubs of agricultural commerce grew in Buffalo, New York, as well as other cities located around navigable U.S. waterways, which enabled delivery of supplies by producers. By 1848, the completion of a new canal and railroad infrastructure centered around Chicago linked the Great Lakes with the Mississippi River, and Chicago became a key hub for agricultural commerce. It was during this time that the Chicago Board of Trade was formed, which would eventually emerge as the preeminent grain exchange in the United States. The emergence of a central grain exchange allowed farmers and grain producers to sell their crops at set prices throughout the months between harvest and allowed consumers to purchase grains at transparent prices throughout the year. After a period of trading forward contracts, the CBOT or CBOT introduced standardized futures contracts in 1865. These centrally cleared contracts, secured with the payment of performance bond or margin payments by clearing members, introduced a level of reliability and security to buyers and sellers which stabilized the markets against the possibility of default. The Chicago Produce Exchange was established in 1874 as a dedicated exchange for the cash trade of butter and eggs, which established grades and rules of trading. In 1898, Change. Throughout the 20th century, additional innovative futures contracts were introduced by the Chicago exchanges. In 1992, futures contracts began trading electronically on the CME Globex platform. Today, tens of millions of contracts are traded daily across all asset classes on CME Globex with millisecond timestamp precision. However, the fundamental benefits resulting from the growth and innovation of the original Midwest grain futures markets remain risk management, transparency, price discovery, liquidity, and security. 
and are essential to the role of futures markets in the global economy today. Hi, my name is Louis Navarro, oh, no. and this I'm is, a one percenter. This is not what I want. I own a multi-million dollar oh, estate shoot. on the South Florida coast in one of America's most exclusive neighborhoods. Famous motivational. At my private country club, I rub elbows with PJ Gray. All right, sorry about that. We're gonna get we're gonna get smoother on these transitions. I promise. Um, so, I know I know those videos are are maybe kind of a, a little bit a little bit hokey, but I I think they're they're nice just to give um, a bit of background, um, and also because I mean people learn in different ways, and so you know if I say something, uh, sometimes it helps to hear just kind of a different way way of phrasing the the same stuff. Um, so. We had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so I think we're going to get more into kind of how far in the future these contracts go um, in a little bit. Um, and then um, a, a great question kind of preempting the, the video, how do Chicago prices come into play? So for anyone gr growing grain in the Midwest, um, I mean, the Chicago prices are really, I mean, that that's the futures market that we're talking about when we're talking about the futures market. So. So Chicago prices are key. Um, so um, I mentioned this before, but we, we really want to think about the this as the world market, and this this Chicago um, Mercantile Exchange is, is really the, the the world market for for corn. Um, So what, what's the big advantage of a futures exchange? Um, and, and one of the big advantages is standardization. So um, we know exactly kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about number two yellow corn, for example. Uh, we know, you know when the transaction is taking place. It's happening. So for a July futures contract, it's going to happen at the, the end of July is when this transaction is going to take place. We know exactly how much of the commodity we're going to exchange. So again, for a corn contract, it's five thousand bushels, and we know we know where. So this, if you go into these contracts, it'll tell you kind of exactly the place along the Illinois River um, that you'd have to deliver this grain to. So, so when we when we specify out and have a standard set of kind of the who, what, when, where, and how much, all that's left is to negotiate the price, um, and so that's going to make these markets uh, really powerful. Um, because we're going to be able to, to pool the information to have, to have really good price discovery. Um, cause we really want the prices that are trading in these markets to reflect the true world supply and the true world demand and all the information that we know about where those might be headed. So another benefit, if we think about having a standardized exchange is eliminating counterparty risk. So that's kind of a, a fancy way of saying, uh, making sure that you're dealing with, with credible people. So if you think about, if you had a contract with kind of just Joe Schmo uh, down the street to, to sell, you know, so, so many amounts, so many bushels for some set amount price, uh, you might be worried that Joe Schmo is going to flake out on you. You know, this is, this might not be a reliable person. So, you know, you might kind of bring all your grain that you grew um, to sell at some price, and they might say, uh, I don't have the money to pay. Um, so by having a standardized exchange where this is guaranteed by the exchange, um, you don't have to worry about kind of whether there's someone reliable on the other side. You can know that when you sell in to these contracts, you're going to get paid. Um, so that's, that's another benefit of having a centralized exchange compared to a world where it's just kind of everyone making deals with whoever they can find.
So uh, a lot of these points I've, I've hit on, but um, we'll, we'll talk about them again. The economic functions of a futures market. So the, the key one here is how it transfers risk. So there's kind of two types of participants that we can think about. So, so one is a speculator. So a speculator wants to take on risk um, for a cost. So for, uh, for a certain price, if they think they can gain in the market, they're willing to take on some risk. So they're willing to accept the possibility that, hey, maybe I lose a lot of money, but I think that, in fact, I'm going to make, make a lot of money. Um, so sometimes speculator gets kind of thrown around as a, a dirty word, but I, I don't want us to think about it that way um, because they're really essential for these markets working. And then we have hedgers. Um, and so these are people who want to get rid of risk. So they want to kind of re reduce the variability, usually because they're either buying or selling a huge amount of the commodity. So uh, if, you're, if you're growing corn, uh, you know, you and you're using kind of these, these risk tools that I'm going to talk about, you are a hedger. So when we, when we talk through the presentation today, we'll be talking about hedging. So um, we're not going to talk about kind of speculating at all. Uh, we're going to assume that people are interested in reducing their risk, not kind of going out and looking for more risk. Um, so, so that's one. It, it kind of transfers risk from people who want less risk to people who are willing to take on more risk. Um, and then the other is price discovery. So we think about kind of all the things that affect the world supply and demand. So, you know, the, the weather in kind of Brazil, uh, you can think about kind of increasing population in, in China. Um, you know, if, if people are building ethanol plants, um, if there's a change in biofuel policy. So all, all of these things can affect the supply and demand. And the nice thing about these futures markets is that because anyone can trade on them, Anyone who has a piece of information um, about where these trends are going can use it to try and make money and then collectively, you know, finding the right price. Um, so, so the price discovery and the information collection go really hand in hand. So, you know, I don't know anything about how to forecast rainstorms in Brazil, um, but someone does. And they're going to kind of use that skill to try and make money on this market. And so then when I go and look at the, the futures price, uh, on soybeans, I know that that price factors in kind of the skill set of people who are really good at predicting Brazilian rainstorms. Um, so that's kind of a piece of information I wouldn't have, uh, but because we have well-functioning markets, uh, I, I can act as if I do have that piece of information uh, when I'm kind of making plans for my soybean crop. Um, so another is, is market uh, stabilization. So I mean, there's, there's no doubt that the prices go up and down. I mean, anyone who's been watching the markets the past year obviously knows that. Um, but without these markets, you know, I, I think it's pretty fair to say there would be even more volatility. Um, and the reason for that is because, uh, as I mentioned before, if you were just kind of out on your own to find a buyer for your crop, um, you know, there'd be times when you wouldn't be able to, to find one. Um, and so there would be a, a lot more variation in the prices. Um, and, and we see that too, in, in crops that don't have these types of markets, um, there can be kind of bigger swings. And then the last one is really kind of why this matters um, for you probably is that all of this is happening in the background and it gives you flexibility in pricing your crop. Um, so because these markets exist, it opens up kind of a whole suite of tools that you can use um, to reduce your risk um, and hopefully get a good price for your crop. So some symbols um, when we talk about futures contracts. So, so again, here I'm, I'm talking about the Chicago futures market. Um, that's the futures market. Um, at, for the rest of this talk, if I, if I talk about futures, I'm talking about the Chicago exchange. Um, so C is going to stand for corn, not surprising. S is soy, W is, is a soft red winter wheat, and it, it does actually matter kind of what sort of wheat you're talking about. Um, so, so no surprises there. Uh, when we move into the months, so these are the, the months when the contract comes due, um, we get a bunch of, of weird letters. Um, so these are kind of all 12 months of the year, but we don't have contracts available for every month of the year um, for crops. So it, let's... We'll look at corn first. So we have H, so that's going to be a, a March futures contract. So the delivery date, the time when you kind of owe that crop to uh, the Illinois River is 
going to be March. Um, K, we come down to July. Oh, sorry, May. I skipped, skipped May. Uh, N, that's going to be the July. Um, U is September, and then Z is December. And so um, December is actually the most traded um, futures contract. And that's because it's the first futures contract that happens after the, the U.S. harvest. So kind of, you also might hear it called a, a new crop, a new crop uh, corn futures contract is going to be December. Um, so wheat has the, the same month. So you have March, May, July, September, December, and then soy is a little bit different. So you have January, March, May, July, August, September, and then November. So soy has kind of different contract months. So you, you might ask, and you would be reasonable for asking, why can't we just have all the months? You know, why, why do we only get a certain amount of contracts um, offered? And the reason to this really comes back to um, how do we get these markets to be really liquid so that kind of we get as many people as possible in them kind of sharing whatever information that they have. Um, and so, you know, if you had 12 contracts, uh, you would imagine uh, that there would be less actors involved in any given contract. Um, and so that's going to make the markets not as liquid. So in order to have really high volume and have really liquid markets so that, um, you know, if there's a seller, there's always a buyer. Um, that's why they, they limit them. Um, let's see. So I'm going to, I'm going to look at the, the questions real quick. Um, so, so how far into the future? I think uh, I'll still, I, I hope that I've given a partial answer to that and I'm going to get an even better answer to that in, in a couple of slides. Um, so can you still deliver on a contract? So, um, the answer is, is yes, uh, you can, um, but, uh, <laughs> It's very rarely done, and I'm not going to talk about um, how it's done. Um, and, and very few of these contracts are actually delivered on. So it, I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I want to say it's around kind of 3% of these contracts are actually, you know, you, you take your contract, you drive it to the Illinois River, and you deliver on that contract. Um, I think if we have, if we have uh, time at the end, I think Roger has a good story about that. Um, so Diego asks, uh, what if I went into a futures contract? I'm a corn producer. I promised 10,000 bushels, but weather brought me down to 6,500 uh, 6, bushels. Am I on the hook for that? This is a great question. Um, so the answer is that yes. Um, so you you are on the hook. So you would need to, um, you would either have to, to buy your way out of the, that futures contract. So you, you sold a futures contract uh, for 10,000 bushels. You'd have to buy that back. Or if you were planning on delivering, you would have to buy on the cash market um, to make up the difference. So, so that's a risk um, when you kind of, I really kind of whether it's a futures contract or whether it's any contract, uh, if you're promising a certain amount of corn and you haven't grown it yet, um, you know that that's a risk um, that you're going to come up short uh, because of weather um, and, and be under. Uh, a great question from James. How did the months get assigned a letter? And I do not know the answer to that. So uh, I will try and look it up. My, uh, there might be some interesting history there, but I, I do not know kind of why, why the months are certain letters. And then Joss asks, uh, if December is the highest traded month for corn, does that tend to make it um, the lowest price? Um, so I don't want to make a kind of a sweeping statement about when prices are, are highest or lowest, uh, but we, we do see that in general as the harvest come in, and, uh, you know, assuming it's a good harvest, um, that's going to drive prices down. Um, and then as we get out into July, kind of before we know much about the, the, new, the new harvest coming in, that's when we see prices kind of tend to float up. All right, so now I'm gonna, oh no. 
I'm going to take another risk and I'm going to try and some of these ideas are, are looking better and not as not as wise in, <laughs> in hindsight. Um, but I'm going to try and kind of poke around on, on this website while I'm in screen share. Um, so this is the Chicago Chicago Exchange. So hopefully you can see my screen. So I'm looking at um, corn futures quote. So this is the, the Chicago Mercantile Group. So this is their website. Um, yeah, I can yeah. only see your PowerPoint still. Oh, all right. <sighs> now I can see it. All right, I am so sorry guys. <laughs> I really, it seems so simple and then you start doing it and then it's, it's not as simple. Um, so these are, these are the current corn futures quotes. Um, so this is kind of right from the horse's mouth. Um, so we can see, this is our, our March contract. So this is a, a contract you would take on um, to deliver corn in March. Um, and again, um, as we'll see later in the presentation, you're not gonna be delivering on this. You're gonna, you're gonna buy at the end so that you don't have that obligation. And so it's trading for, um, $5.53. And then after this apostrophe here is a six. And so you might think, and I would say that you would be pretty reasonable for thinking that that is 0.6, but that is not true. So this is, uh, so these are measured in eighths of cents. So this is six eighths of a cent. So three quarters of a cent. So $5.53 and three quarters of a cent. And someone's going to ask, why is it that way? And that is another question that I don't have the answer to. Um, that's just the way it's done for ag commodities. Um, if, you, if you go over to gold, they'll do it in decimal points. So it's kind of different for different types of commodities. So we can see here, we got our, our March contract. Uh, May's trading for a little less. Um, July's trading for a lot less. Um, so that's normally we kind of have the other story where kind of the, the contracts go up and up as you go farther into the future, and that's because of storage costs. Um, so we'll talk more about this in a bit, but what the market's really telling us here is that it doesn't want to pay for storage. It really um, kind of now is better. There's, there's a demand for the crop right now, um, and they don't want to, to compensate to have it stored out to July. Um, so let's, I'm just going to click on this. So this is going to show what these March 2021 contracts have been trading at in the past. So so now you can see we can go all the way out to when this contract was first introduced. So this contract first came online uh, in December of 2018. Um, and you can see what was it back then? It was 419 roughly. Um, and you can see down at the bottom, this is gonna show the volume of trading. So this is kind of how many people are trading this contract. Um, and as you might imagine, back in early, early 2019, you know, there wasn't a lot of interest in this March 2021 futures contract. So, so people weren't very interested in buying it and people weren't very interested in selling it. Um, and then as we get into, to 2020, um, and kind of everyone knows the story here, um, with the lockdowns and ethanol demand and just a general recession, um, we start to see this price drop down. And we also start to see people start really kind of jumping into this March 2021 contract. Um, and so all of the contracts are going to kind of have the same general shape. Um, which is makes sense, right? Because they're all related, right? So, um, you know, corn in March is, is obviously different than corn in July, but it can't be, the price can't be too different, right? Because otherwise people would just buy the corn in March, stick it in the bin, and then they would be able to make money in July. So there would be arbitrage opportunities if these kind of were going on completely divergent paths. So let me, we'll do, uh, one more just for fun, but I don't want to. I don't want to hammer the point home too too much. Um, but I think, yeah. So here's here's the July contract, and we can see kind of that same that same shape. 
Um, so this people not very not very much volume, so not very much price changing. We also don't have really any of the relevant information kind of way back here. As we start to get more information about what the supply and demand situation looks like, that's when we start to see these swings. All right, I should be back to my PowerPoint. Am I back to my PowerPoint? Yep, I can see your PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Great. See, I told I told everyone I was going to get better at this. So here's here's a what a corn futures contract looks like, and we're going to kind of talk through some key pieces of information. So um, contract unit is five thousand bushels. So so this is important. So uh, a lot of these tools you don't you know. Sorry, a lot of the tools that we talk about, you, you don't have to have a specified amount, but if you're going to be buying and selling futures contracts, it's in chunks of 5,000 bushels. So you either need to have that much that you're marketing yourself or kind of get together with a friend uh, to get you to that, that unit. Um, the price quoted are in, are in US cents. So you'll see it's, I, I, I said it was 553, but it's actually the price quoted is, is 553. So these are in, in, in pennies. Um, you can see their trading hours. So the minimum that a price can change is one fourth of a cent. So you'll see kind of after that apostrophe on the price, you'll see two, four, six, um, or zero. And that's the, the smallest amount that the prices can change by. So um, so the, the reason that it's so small, the reason that they don't just stick with one penny is because they really want to be able to have the price that's quoted be kind of the, the real exact price. Um, so we talked about this before, kind of the various contracts that are listed. Um, and then the settlement method is deliverable. So even though very few of these contracts get delivered on, um, this is what gives them their value is that you can either to, to meet your obligation, um, you can deliver on it, or if you've bought a futures contract, um, you can you can take delivery, so you can kind of pick it up from the delivery point. Um, so you can't trade these past the the fifteenth day of the contract month. So that's when when trading is done, and then uh, the next roughly two weeks are are the delivery period. So that's when you can deliver on these contracts. Um, so the prices that are quoted down here at the bottom, these are for number two yellow corn. So if you have number one yellow corn, that's a one point five cent per bushel premium. Um, and then number three yellow is gonna be a 1.5 cent discount. Um, and then there's other kind of moisture and quality considerations, um, just like there would be at an elevator or anywhere else really. So um, just, just like your local elevator, if you deliver on these contracts, they're expecting 15% moisture. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cover the wheat contract um, just because it's highlight kind of just a couple of differences. And then I'm gonna take another crack at the questions. Um, so just like corn, 5,000 bushels. Um, and then kind of same, same settlement method. Um, so you would ship your wheat to Chicago if you wanted to deliver on these contracts. Um, and then the quoted prices are for number two, soft red winter. Um, if you had a number one, that's a three cent premium. So now I'm gonna kind of look through the questions. Um, so we have some answers to things I don't know. So that's great. So people should scroll through these um, and, and kind of learn those. Um, yeah, so the Andersons, the Elevator Group, also have an easy to use website. So you don't have to use uh, the, the CME website. Um, there's definitely other resources. Um, Matt, if I buy into a futures contract, is there a term for this? Um, so I'm not actually sure that I fully understand the question. Let's hold off on that a couple of slides, and, and hopefully that one will be resolved. Um, so Chris has a great question. You know, how many? How do you figure out how many bushels you want you want to contract? Uh, what's a safe percentage? Um, that is going to be beyond the scope of this workshop, though. So kind of figuring out the exact marketing strategy um, is just kind of beyond on this one. So 
it's, you know, always, always a good rule to never sell all of your crop to one place. Um, and then how do you know what quality your corn is? Um, that's another good question that I should know that I actually, I don't know. So there's, you know, for each of these, there's a, a outline set of spec specifications. Um, and then whoever you're selling it to normally, it's going to tell you if you're not kind of up to snuff on those specifications. But I don't know kind of the exact specifications off the top of my head. All right. So here we see uh, corn futures over time. And so this is the, the nearby month. So at any given point in time, it's showing the, the futures price for the, the upcoming contract. So the, the closest contract that's coming up. Um, so, you know, probably everyone on the call has, has seen a graph that looks something like this. So, you know, high prices in 2012 um, and then kind of much, much lower prices up until quite recently where we saw uh, a big a big price surge. So I know I'm I know I'm repeating myself, but this is really this is the world price of corn. So um, you know when you think about kind of everyone in the world when they think about what corn's worth, this is kind of the the number that they have in mind. Um, and then what what price you get for your corn is going to depend on on other factors that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, soy futures wheat futures. All right, so now we're going to do just a, a really simple exercise. Um, and we're going to think about someone who's speculating futures. So this is just to illustrate kind of how you can, yeah, how a futures works. So, so the day is February 15th. We're going to buy July futures at 520. And then a little over a month later, we're going to sell that same futures contract for 560. So we're going to say, Suppose it went up 40 cents, we're going to buy it and we're going to sell it and then we're going to net 40 cents. So, so no crop was delivered, right? So we're not even close to July yet. Um, but if kind of this was the prices and these were your actions, you've netted 40 cents. Um, now, suppose you get to May and you think, hey, 590, uh, I think these prices are going to go down. So then you can sell at 590. Um, and if you're right, so let's say, it does drop, you can buy back. So 590 down to 510, you can pocket another 80 cents. So the, all of this is happening with no corn exchanging hands because July isn't here yet. So you got in this market, you bought, then you sold, you were out of the market, then you sold again, so you're back in the market, then you bought back to offset the amount that you sold. And now you're out of the market up a buck 20, kind of way before any of these contracts are, are taking place. So. This is just to, to illustrate that you know if you're a speculator, you don't need you don't need prices to go up. You can make money kind of either way as long as you know which direction they're going. Um, and so that's just another way that these these markets aggregate information. Um, so that was just a really simple example. Um, so all these prices are quoted per bushel, but these contracts are five thousand bushels. So if you made a buck twenty, how much money did you make? Six thousand. Now we're going to talk about hedging. So hedging is when we use this futures market to reduce our risk and lock in a price. So what that means is that there's the cash market and then there's also the futures market. So I really want you to think of these as two different things. So in one, you're kind of buying and selling your corn. And then in this other market, this different market, you're buying or selling this obligation to deliver at some point in the future um, that's going to be specified in the contract. So hedging is when we take the opposite position in the future market as the cash market. So we're going to be buying in the cash market. And then at the same time, we're going to be selling in the futures market. Um, so, you know, it, if you're, if you're a farmer, you are, you are long in the cash market. You are, you are very invested um, in, in the, in the cash market before you even get your harvest, right? So um, you you buy your harvest when you buy the land, you buy your harvest when you buy your inputs. Um, you buy your harvest if you if you buy labor, if you have capital, kind of all of that is is buying a future harvest. Um, and so 
uh, you're in a risky spot, um, which is why it can often make sense to kind of take a, an opposite position in the futures market to reduce some of this risk. All right, we have another video. Oof. All right, please let me know if you can't see or can't can't hear. I'm only seeing your PowerPoint still, Matt. Ah, all right. <laughs> How about now? Still just the PowerPoint. Oh, now I see the video. Great. Our primary participants in the futures markets. A hedger is any individual or firm that buys or sells the actual physical commodity. Many hedgers are producers, wholesalers, retailers, or manufacturers, and they are affected by changes in commodity prices, exchange rates, and interest rates. Changes to any of these variables can impact a firm's bottom line when they bring goods to the market. To minimize the effects of these changes, hedgers will utilize futures contracts. Unlike speculators who assume market risk for profit, hedgers use futures markets to manage and offset risk. Let's look at an example of a corn farmer. In the spring, the farmer is concerned about the price for his crops when he sells in the fall. If prices drop at harvest, the farmer will have to sell the crop at a lower price. One way the farmer could hedge this exposure would be to sell a corn futures contract. When harvest rolls around and the price of corn drops, he will see a loss in price when he sells his crop in the local market. However, that loss would be offset by a trading gain in the futures market. If prices rallied at harvest, the farmer would have a trading loss in the futures market, but his crop would be sold at a higher price in the local market. In either scenario, the hedged farmer has added protection against adverse price movements. The use of futures enables him to establish a price level well before he sells the crop in his local market. Hedgers concerned about rising commodity prices are called buy-side hedgers or long hedgers. Sell-side hedgers, also known as short hedgers, are concerned about falling prices. A third category of hedger is the merchandiser. Merchandisers both buy and sell commodities. Their risk is different than the directional risk of a traditional buying and selling hedger. Their risk is the spread or difference between the purchase and the selling prices that determine their profitability. Many industries now use the risk management potential of futures contracts for a variety of assets. The profitability of a construction company partially depends on the cost of building materials. By purchasing a steel futures contract, the firm is able to secure a price at which it acquires steel. Conversely, steel mills worried about the decline in building demand and the drop in steel prices can sell steel futures contracts to protect against that price movement. Airlines now hedge against rising fuel costs through the use of crude oil futures and jewelry manufacturers can hedge against gold and silver price movement by utilizing precious metals futures contracts. When it comes to hedging, there are a variety of market participants who buy and sell physical commodities, and they may benefit from the added price protection offered by futures and options contracts. Great. So now we're going to move straight from there to um, a really simple pre-recorded hedging example um, without any basis. So we're going to totally ignore basis um, and we're just going to look at how a hedge works kind of under, under those conditions. Uh, so I have to apologize. So there is one part of the video where you can't see the thing that I write on the chalkboard at the very bottom. But I say it, and it's just the top number minus the number right below. So I think it'll be pretty obvious um, when you see it. So I, I wouldn't be worried about it. Um, but 
it is kind of not ideal, obviously. Um, so let me get the share running. So we're gonna do a really simple example of a hedge, just to, to illustrate. So um, to make this kind of as simple as possible, we're going to assume that the basis is zero. So the cash price at a given point in time is going to be the same as the futures price. And then we're going to assume that storage also equals zero. And then in addition to that, we're going to kind of ignore interest rates and we're also going to ignore kind of brokerage fees. So the only things that we're tracking here are the, the cash market and the futures market. So we're going to assume that the, the price in the, the cash market, let's say that it's 549. So I just said. Matt, I'm not sure what's happening. The video paused. I don't know if your internet yourself. Lagging. So the video paused. Uh, this is the price for that contract right now. Is it still paused? So those are the prices. Um, so now we need to choose Thanks. kind of whether we're buying or selling. So. If you have the grain, um, then you bought it, right? So you bought the land, you bought the seed, you bought the fertilizer, you bought the labor, you bought that grain. And so you bought it at this cash price. So we can also refer to that as we bought it and now we're going to store it. So you didn't know that was the price that you bought it for when you were growing it, but that's what it is now. You have the corn, so you bought it. You can sell it if you want to, but right now you have it. So 549, buying in the cash market. So with the hedge, we're always going to be doing the opposite action in the futures market that we're doing in the cash market. So we're buying in the cash market. So over here, we're going to be selling futures at 549. So when we're selling a futures, what are we doing? We're taking on the obligation to deliver grain to a given spot on the Illinois River at the futures expiration date. So when the future expires, we have the obligation to deliver. Now we're going to see that no delivery is going to be taking place. You know, no one's loading up the grain and shipping it to Illinois, but we have the obligation to do so. Um, and so we're going to have to get out of that obligation. Um, and that's, that's the next step. So, so some time passes. This is kind of just the passage of timeline. So now prices, let's say that they went up. So we didn't know that they were going to go up, but they did. So now it's 569. So basis is zero, 569 in the cash market. That means we're also at 569 in the futures market. So now we have this, we're holding on to this obligation. So how are we going to get out of that obligation? 
we're going to have to buy futures. So we're going to be buying futures at 569, and we're going to sell our grain on the cash market here. So let's take the markets one at a time. So what happened in the cash market? Well, we bought at 549 by growing the grain and storing it. And then we sold at 569. So 569 minus 549, we came out 20 cents ahead. So that's great. So now in the futures market, what happened? Well, we sold at 549 and we bought at 569. So we came out 20 cents behind. So this is working how it's supposed to. So our, our gains in the cash market were offset by our losses in the futures market. So what happened then, because we have offsetting gains and losses, is we were able to lock in this net price of 549. So when people talk about using a hedge to lock in a price, you know, you might reasonably say, you know, what, what price am I locking in? Am I locking in a price in the cash market? Am I locking in a price in the futures market? And the answer is neither. You know, the cash market price will continue to fluctuate as prices do. The futures market price will continue to fluctuate as prices do. And what you've locked in is a net price by taking advantage of the fact that you have two markets that you can be operating in. So in this example, you might say, well, shoot, if I had known that the price was going to go from 549 to 569, I shouldn't have bought futures. I should have just held my cash grain and sold at a profit. And that's true, but as everyone knows, one thing about prices is that we don't know what direction they're going to go always, right? So, so we assume here that prices went up, uh, and now, now I'll kind of rework the bottom half of this for a case where they go down. So you can, you probably can see where I'm headed with this, but we'll work through the math just for fun. So now we're going to say that prices go down, let's have them go down 30 cents. So we're at 519. So again, basis is zero. We have 519 here as well. So I'm going to be selling in the cash market. I'm going to be buying in the futures market to get out of that obligation. And then what's going to happen? So in the cash market, there was a decrease in the price. So I came out 30 cents under. But because I locked in this price, I locked in this net price, we know that our gains in the future market are going to offset all of those losses. So so negative 30 cents, positive 30 cents is going to be equal to zero. So equal to zero, and our net price is what we knew it was when we locked it in. So. In this example, I've had basis just be zero. We're going to see some examples in, in future problems where the basis, well, in all our examples in the future, uh, pretty much, we're going to have basis not equal to zero. And in addition to that, we might have the basis strengthening or weakening. Um, so when that happens, you know, it's not necessarily the case that these are going to be exactly equal if the basis is changing. Um, so even when we have this hedge, we're still going to be exposed to risk in the basis, something we'll call basis risk. Um, and so in future videos, um, what I'll be showing you is trying to get a hint of kind of when this is a good option 
um, and when when we want to employ a hedge. And so, you know, here we've had gains of zero, uh, but in other videos, uh, there might be opportunities. We'll see settings where there's opportunities to actually lock in a price that's higher than the price that you can get in the cash market. So that's that's really when a hedge is best to deploy, right? When we can lock in this net price and we've locked it in and it's higher than the price that we can get in the cash market. So hopefully everyone, we can see back the, the slides now. Um, so that, that's a hedge with, with no basis. Um, and so now, now I'm gonna switch gears here and talk a bit about basis. So basis is just the difference between the cash price and the futures price. Uh, and this is normally defined as the difference between the current cash price and the price of the, the futures contract with the nearest expiration date. So for example, today's basis in Weberville is gonna be the difference between cash prices at Weberville and today's price on a March futures contract. Um, in Michigan, these are usually negative. Um, we'll, talk, we'll talk about why. Um, so the reason why is transportation costs. So because these contracts have to be delivered on the Illinois River, um, you know, if you actually deliver on these contracts, you're going to need to get your grain from here to there. Um, there's going to be costs associated with that. Um, another thing affecting basis is, is storage and interest costs. And then a big one is local supply and demand. So if you think about kind of a, a new ethanol plant going in, that's gonna affect your basis. That, that means that there's gonna be more demand in your local area uh, for corn, uh, which means that your basis um, is going to strengthen. Um, and then uh, geographic variation in yield too. So this, these kind of can tie nicely together. If, if you have an ethanol plant nearby and then you got hit with a flood or something that really depressed local yields, um, you're going to have a, much, a very strengthened basis um, because kind of demand is, is high um, and supply is low. So, so the basis really takes into account these local factors that they might not affect the world price. I mean, one more ethanol plant in Michigan is not going to you know, change the whole world outlook, but it can affect the prices in your local area. Um, and so that's, it does that through basis. Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to skip this video for now. Um, so here's, I just have a really, really simple graphic. So you can see uh, this bottom line here is the cash price on a specific contract. Um, and you can see above that, the, the futures price. Sorry, this is just the cash price in the local area, not on a contract. And then above that is the futures price on a given contract that expires here at the end of the, the graph. Um, and so you can see the difference in between here is the basis. So you can see kind of over here, it's really small and then it, it widens out here and then it, it converges again at the end. So a little bit of, of theory. Um, so, you know, as we know, theory isn't always reality, but um, it is useful for kind of fixing our thinking about how we think about basis. So what I've shown here is uh, we have price on the, the Y axis and we have kind of time on the x-axis so we have kind of think about a harvest um, in, in early november we have december march may july these lines show the price of a futures contract for that month so you know a july futures contract is going to be trading we'd expect it to be trading well above a december futures contract um, and as we get to that month uh, we see a convergence in the cash price with this wedge in between. And so this wedge is the transportation cost. So, you know, if you're um, here in, in Lansing, uh, where I'm at, uh, you're not going to see your cash price converge on the futures price, even at contract expiration, because you have the transportation costs um, associated with that. So in between here, these levels are affected by the storage costs. So we would expect a, a March contract to be trading um, higher than a December contract by exactly the amount that it costs to store from December to March. Um, and then you can see March to May, you have to kind of pay that additional storage that boosts up the price of a May contract. Um, and then same from May to July. So this is, this is the theory um, we'd expect to see as we look out kind of futures 
contract prices trading higher and higher um, to reflect the price of storage. Um, now, if you kind of harken back to earlier in the presentation, you saw that that wasn't the case right now, um, which is when the market just doesn't want to pay for the storage. Um, and that's, that's kind of the market telling us something. Um, so now I'm going to, um, we're going to take a look at kind of what the basis is in a few different locations. So hopefully everyone sees the Progressive Farmer Powered by DTN website. So this is just kind of a, another place um, you can go for to look at the futures prices as well as, as local bids. Um, if you want kind of the, the full history, you know you have to pay for that, but this, this one's free. Um, so we can see here on the front page, we have the futures contracts and um, what a, a March futures contract is, is trading at. Um, and then we're going to go to local grain bids. So I'm going to type in my zip code. We're going to see what pops up. So these are the prices and the basis at elevators kind of near, near me. So you can see the ADM over in Grand Ledge. Uh, the basis for corn is minus 18 cents and the basis for soybeans is minus 10 cents. Um, so then if you go over to Potterville or, or Charlotte, they're going to give you different numbers. Um, so here's a, an estimated basis of minus 21 cents, minus 35 cents for soybeans. Um, so you can see kind of like, you know, these places aren't that far apart, uh, but you have a, a, pretty, a pretty big difference in the basis. Um, and for soybeans, you have a, yeah. Uh, quite a large difference in the basis. So here's a map that shows kind of the basis everywhere. Um, so for corn, you can see it's a little hard to tell here, but as you get close to Chicago, you generally have a, a stronger basis, which is exactly what you'd expect because you, um, you don't have as much transportation costs. Um, We'll look at wheat, so showing kind of a, a basis around, as we get into the top of the thumb, it's, it's quite low, around uh, minus 70 cents. Um, and then here's soybeans. Um, so here you, you really see kind of that, that pretty spatial pattern of um, close to zero near Chicago and then of getting more and more negative as you get farther out um, and farther from the Mississippi. All right, I'm gonna go back to my slides. Um, and so now I'm going to show a, a pretty cool tool um, that's put out by uh, Purdue University um, that is going to show uh, kind of what basis has been historically and how we can use that to, to try and develop a forecast of basis. All right. So we're going to look at Michigan, not Indiana. Um, and let's go, we'll go to Eaton County. Um, so first we'll look at, at corn. So, so what's going on here? So this blue line is the average basis um, in this region, so it's averaged over a, a bunch of spots um, within in the south central region of Michigan uh, for the past three years. And the past three years is generally what you want to be using um, to create an expectation about basis. So there was some research a few years back that 
kind of looked at how many years do you want to average? And if you go back 10 years, you're just adding a bunch of noise. So if you really, the, the most recent three years are the good frame of reference to look for for basis. Um, so here we have the nearby contract. So you can see uh, December and then this basis reflects the March. We can also change it up so that we're looking at just a July contract the whole time. And then here you see this really nice, this nice trend as kind of the harvest comes in, uh, basis is pretty negative. Um, and then as we get into the next summer, basic strengthens and strengthens. Um, and we'll see in a little bit how we can kind of use this um, to make money on a hedge. Um, if, we, if we know the basis is gonna strengthen, we can take advantage of that fact. And then the black line is um, this year's basis. So can we have it up to, to February? And then we kind of don't know what's coming after that. So this is this year versus the average. So, so this tool I, I, I pretty highly recommend. Uh, I think it's a, a nice way to form expectations about basis. So now I'm gonna show a hedging example where we take into account this basis. Sorry, one second here, pulling it up. So in our last hedge example, uh, we didn't consider basis at all. So we have, can everyone hear that? Yep, yep. The basis was just equal to zero. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't strengthening or weakening. It just it just stayed at zero. So we kind of totally ignored that really important part of a hedge. Um, so in this example, we're going to look at basis, and we're going to see that what basis is doing, whether it's strengthening or weakening, determines whether or not you're making. Matt, the video disappeared on my end. On February 23rd is... Whether or not you're making or losing Sorry, money you can't see the video? on this hedge. It's back up. So we're going to hmm, look at today's weird. date, so February 23rd. Um, and then these prices are just prices that I made up for the sake of the example. But let's, let's say that the cash price on February 23rd is 496. And then let's say that July futures are trading at 547 today. So today's price on a July futures contract, we're going to say is 547. So it doesn't have to be a July futures contract. Um, we could do a hedge on May futures, um, or if we were back in the fall, we could set up a hedge on March futures. Um, we probably wouldn't do September futures just because then the, the new crop's starting to come in. Um, but we could do March, May, or July. Uh, for this example, we're going to look at July futures. A few other things that we didn't consider in the previous example. Uh, storage, we're going to assume two cents per month. So this could be on-farm or off-farm stor storage. Obviously, kind of the prices that you're effectively paying are going, are going to differ, but we're going to assume two cents per, per, per month for storage costs. And those are going to be really important, as we'll see. And then a brokerage fee of just one cent. This isn't one cent per month. This is just a one-time fee to get into this hedge. So this is not going to be as important as the storage cost, not even close, um, but it's still there, so we're still going to include it in our calculation. So let's start in the cash market. So hopefully you have the, the hedge table that was posted on the website printed out and you can write along with me as I go through this example. Um, if not, that's something that you can do kind of after the workshop um, to see if you can fill out the hedge table on your own. 
So I'm going to start with the date, so February 23rd. And what's the price in the cash market? It's 496. And what action are we taking in this market? Well, if we have the grain and we're going to store it, then we're effectively buying. So I'm going to write buy slash store. Now let's go to the futures market. So what's the price of July futures? 547. And what action are we going to take in this market? Well, because of the hedge, we're always doing the opposite action in the futures market as we're doing in the cash market. So in the cash market, we're buying. So that means we're going to be selling in the futures market. So we're going to sell July futures. So this means that we're taking on that obligation to deliver in July if we hold this contract all the way to the delivery date. We're not going to do that. We're going to get out of this hedge in June prior to the delivery date. We'll show that in just a second. So what's, what's the basis right here in February? So if we remember our formula, our basis is going to be the cash price minus the futures. So 496 minus 547. So if we do that math in our head, we're going to see the basis minus 51 cents. So this is our actual basis. What's our expected basis here? Well, it's the same thing, right? So we, we don't need to form an expectation. We already know. So we're here in the present, and the expected basis is the same as the actual basis. So now we're going to skip four months ahead when it's time to get out of this head. So I'm going to say it's June 23rd. The, the days of the month don't have to be the same. That's just going to make it a little bit easier for me with the storage costs as we do these calculations. So now we're here in June. Do we know what happened in the market? Well, no, we don't. Cash might have gone up. Futures might have gone up or down. You know, we don't, we don't know what's going to happen to prices. Um, but we're not totally in the dark, right? So we have an expectation about basis. So we have an expectation about the relationship of the cash price to the futures price in June. So this is our expected basis in June. So we're going to fill that in over here. We think that this basis is going to be minus 30 cents. So where did we get this expected basis from? Well, one sensible way to do it would be to look in your local area at the basis in June on July futures for the past three years and just take an average. So you'd look back last year, two years ago, and three years ago, and average those three numbers to give you an expectation about what basis is. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, regardless of how we got there, we're just gonna say for this example that this is our expectation. So, so how do we expect this hedge to work based on our expectation about basis? Well, we're going to go from minus 51 cents all the way up to minus 31 cents. So we're going up because this is more negative than this number. So we're going up 21 cents. So we're 21 cents ahead, um, but we're not quite ready to put that in our pocket yet because we have some other costs that we need to factor in. So we had storage costs. So how much were those? So we had two cents per month and we had four months, right? March, April, May, June. So four months, so four times two is eight cents. So I have to take that out. And then we have the one cent brokerage fee. So 21 cents minus eight cents storage minus one cent brokerage is going to give us up 12 cents on the head. So then, oh, looks like I already filled it in. Um, so 496 plus this 12 cents gives us our expectation on the hedge. So we're 
expecting a net price of five dollars and eight cents. So that's what we expect, but now let's think about if something different than what we expect actually happens. So now let's say that we get to June and cash prices are 480. And let's say that when we're in June, July futures are trading for 505. So we want to lift this hedge in June. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to sell our cash grain out of the bin for 480. And then, because we don't actually want this obligation to deliver, uh, we're going to buy futures. So we sold them before, and now we're going to buy them back, but at a much lower price, right? At only 505. So we sold them before at 547, and now we're buying them at 505. So how did this work out for us? Well, let's start in the cash market. So prices went down from 496 to 480. So minus 16 cents. But we also have to factor in the fact that we are paying to store it this whole time. So minus another 8 cents. So we're minus 24 cents in the cash market. But we're in two markets. So now we turn to the futures market and we see that we sold at 547, we bought back at 505. So we were 42 cents up in the futures market. But then we have our one cent brokerage costs. So what's our net in the Futures market, 42 minus 1 cent is 41 cents. So what's our net hedge? It's minus 24 plus 41. That's going to be plus 17. So to find our net received price, we're going to add the net of our hedge back to the original cash price. So 496 plus 17 is going to be 513. So what happened? So we expected a net price out of this hedge at 508, and we ended up getting 513. So so what, what differed in our expectation? Well, in a hedge, the only thing that can kind of differ from our expectations is if our expectation of the basis is wrong. So we expected a basis of minus 30 cents. What did it turn out to be? Well, here in June, we had 480 minus 505. The basis was minus 25 cents. So it was a stronger basis than we were expecting. The cash price in our area was closer to the futures price than what we expected. We expected it to be 30 under, it was only 25 under. And so we see that because it was five cents stronger, that's exactly how much stronger our net received price was than what we were expecting. So the five cents above expectation on basis led to a five cents that price received. Um, so in the next video, um, I'll show kind of a simpler way to do this, um, where you just focus on the basis to find kind of what your net received price is going to be. All right. So now I'm going to just really quickly kind of show a, a simpler way to do this with a table where we're not going to actually track the cash price. 
we're just going to look at the basis to calculate kind of how we come out on this edge. So th these are the same numbers as in the video you just saw. So we have a July futures price um, of, of 547. So I said price paid, but we're selling this contract. Um, and then we take out our, our storage costs and our brokerage fees to get the ne next net price. So we have just the futures price um, accounting for our expected basis and our storage and our brokerage. Now, if the actual June basis differs than our expectation, we still have those storage and brokerage costs, but then we get five cents more. So this is the, the same example, but here you can see kind of we don't have to be tracking the, the cash market. We can just look at the, the futures and then know what's happening with basis because basis reflects the cash market because it's the difference between the two. So that's just a, a kind of a simpler way of doing it um, without tracking as, much, as many markets. So if you're in a hedge, um, kind of a natural question is, you know, how long do you stay in it? Um, so you know you probably don't want to ride it all the way to the contract expiration date, um, but how long do you ride it um, before you get out of it? Um, so you don't have to hold it till the end. Um, and the, the answer is if you, you like the current basis, if you think the current basis is good and you expect it to weaken, or at least not strengthen enough to compensate you for your storage, uh, you can get out of your hedge. Um, and you do this by selling cash and buying futures. Um, so that's to offset the fact that you bought cash and sold futures in the past. So how do we know the right time to do this? And that's where this concept of break even basis comes in. So this is the basis necessary to exactly offset your storage costs um, and locking in the current cash price as a net price. So if the basis is weaker than the break-even basis line, that's a time to consider hedging. Um, so if it's weaker than the we expect, um, and we expect it to strengthen a lot, um, that would be a, a good time to consider hedging. Um, if it strengthens above the break-even line, if you're in a hedge and the basis is strengthening above the break-even basis, that's when you consider lifting the hedge because you, you expect it to, to possibly weaken in the future. If it's, if it's strong right now, it's likely to get weaker in the future. Um, so now I have my, my last video of the night um, to, to show this, this break-even basis. All right, here we go. In the last video, we talked about how whether or not a hedge pays off depends on your basis. So when you're, you're in a hedge, the risk is coming from the variation in the basis. You've locked in your net price given an expected basis, um, but you still might kind of win or lose depending on whether basis goes up or down. So in this video, I'm going to walk through Kind of a, a visual representation of break-even basis. So as the name implies, break-even basis is the basis that you need so that your hedge breaks even. So you're not coming out ahead, you're not coming out behind, you're breaking even. So on the, call this the y-axis here, we have the basis. So here's zero. So that's where your cash price is equal to your futures price. Um, and then I'm going to the negative numbers here, just to, to represent the basis that we normally see. And then on this x-axis, I have the months of the year. So we're going to go from an October 15th harvest out to June 15th, when we're going to ultimately have to lift the hedge, um, because we're going to be talking about a July futures contract. So that's the setup. We're going to say that we expect the basis 
in June to be minus 20 cents. So that, that's our expectation. Um, and then we're going to say that storage cost is 3 cents per month. Um, and so just, just a quick note about these storage costs. These are the costs that you pay when you fill the bin with the grain, right? So if you have a mortgage payment, say, on your, your storage facility that you have to pay kind of whether or not it's full, you know, that, that doesn't count. So the, we would call that kind of a fixed cost. And this is a cost that is only incurred if it's filled. So, um, so we're going to say that's three cents. And now we're going to kind of work work our way backwards. So say we're say we're out in June. So the futures contract expires in one month. So we want to lift it in June. Say we were going to enter this hedge in May. So one month before. So what would the basis have to be in May for us to think that this was a good idea? Or for well, to put it a better way, for us to completely come out in a wash. So not ahead and not behind. So if the storage cost is three cents and we're confident in our expected basis in June is going to be minus 20, then our basis in May needs to be minus 23. Minus 23. So why is that? So that's because we need basis to be strengthening three cents that month to offset our three cents of storage costs. So probably a lot of you kind of see where I'm headed with this. So if we jump back another month, we need to be at minus 26. And if we go all the way back to October, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months, we need to be three times eight, so our storage cost of three times eight months, that's going to be 24. So minus 20, that's our expected basis in June, minus 24, we need to be at minus 44 for us to be breaking even on this head if we're entering it in October. Minus 44. So, so we have a, a few points here, and now we're going to kind of connect these points all the way out to draw our break-even basis line. So let's see how good of a straight line I can draw. Well, not too bad. So, so this, for any month that we're in this hedge, this line is going to give us our break-even basis. So what does this tell us? So let's say we're, we're here in October at the harvest and we're, we're thinking about getting into this hedge. So let's say the basis was minus 40. And so we still, we still are expecting that in June it's going to be minus 20 and right now in October it's minus 40. So would we do this hedge? Well, no we wouldn't because we're only going to gain 20 cents in the basis. The basis is only, we only expect it to strengthen 20 cents, but we're going to pay 24 cents in storage. So 20 cents strengthening minus 24 cents in storage. We're going to come out four cents behind rather than just market that grain, sell it in the cash market in October. So so that's, so if the basis is 40, kind of not good enough. And so we're going to see that kind of at any given point in time, if we're on this side of the line and we still think that that minus 20 is our expected basis of June, we should get out of this hedge because this hedge isn't going to make us money, or at least we don't expect it to make us money. But down here below this line, we're going to see that given our expectations, it makes sense to stay in the hedge. So now let's say instead of minus 40, let's say that our basis in October is minus 60. So sitting here in October, how much do we expect 
this hedge to pay. So we think that basis is going to strengthen by 40 cents, right? Because we're at negative 60 now. And we expect it to go to negative 20. And we're going to pay that same 24 cents in storage. So 40 cents minus 24 in storage. We think this hedge is going to pay 16 cents based on our expectations about basis. So now let's just kind of walk through um, just some hypothetical ways that the basis may change um, and talk about you know, when it would make sense to stay in the hedge versus get out of the hedge. So let's say in November, the basis strengthens to minus 50. So we gained 10 cents in the basis, but then we paid three cents for storage, right? So we're looking at plus seven on the hedge so far. So that's good, but we're looking for plus 16 cents, right? So if we still think that minus 20 is the right expectation, then we're, we want to stay in this hedge, right? Because we still think it's going to pay off. Basically, the market is telling us that it wants to pay us for storage. So the increase in the basis is going to fully compensate and then sub for the storage costs. Right, sorry for that brief technical glitch there. Um, so now let's let's jump all the way out to, to February. And let's say that the basis is I'm going to say it's minus 34. So the basis has strengthened from minus 60 to minus 26. And how much have I paid in storage? So one, two, three, four times three. So 26 minus 12. I'm up 14. So that's pretty good. Um, but I thought I was going to be up 16, right? So based on that expectation, I was looking to get to plus 16. Um, and I'm only plus 14. So do you stay in the hedge or do you lift the hedge here? So um, based on your expectations, you want to stay in, right? Because you're looking for the 16 um, and you're only up to 14. Now, if it's February and you've already made a good chunk of change on this hedge, um, you know, you might, you might be thinking about, you know, whether or not your expectation is right. And you might also be thinking about quality, right? So if you're looking at your corn and you're like, mm, I don't know if this is going to make it to June, um, it might be the time to, to get out of this hedge. Um, and so how do you get out of a hedge? Sell in the cash market, and then you buy the futures. So, um, so that's how you flip the hedge. But let's say that you're gonna keep it in there, or maybe you, you lift the hedge on some of, you know, maybe 5,000 bushels and keep another 10,000 bushels in the hedge. So let's say you keep it in there. So now let's let's jump ahead to, to April, and we already calculated the, the break-even basis for April. And let's say let's say basis strengthens a ton. Let's say we're all or, all the way up at minus twenty in April. Well, now how, how's our head to do? So the basis has strengthened from minus sixty to minus twenty, so it's strengthened forty, and we've paid. Five, six times three, we paid 18 in storage. So 40 minus our 18 in storage, we're up 22. So when we entered this hedge, we thought we were looking to make 16 based on our expected basis, but we're making 22. So that's great. We're way ahead. 
now the question is, do we ride this hedge out until June, like the plan was, or do we lift it now? And if we still think expected basis is going to be minus 20, and we're sitting here in April at minus 20, then we got to lift the hedge, right? Because basically this market is not paying us anything for storage, even though storage is costing us three cents a month. So, you know, at this point, we would definitely kind of get all the bushels out of the hedge, given that we still expected this minus 20 basis. And typically, you know, if you're, if you're way above the break even basis line, the basis is probably going to weaken, or at least not strengthen enough to compensate for storage. Um, so at this point, we would lift the hedge and kind of get, get out of the market. So kind of this whole graph really just depends on, on basis and storage. Um, and so what I want to emphasize is that in a hedge, kind of cash prices and futures prices, they, they don't matter. You, you've locked in your futures price. And so whether you're kind of winning or losing really just depends on your storage costs and the basis. You gotta unmute, Mike. Ah, thank you. <laughs> so that was a that was a, a a nice graphical example. I think that kind of helps um, fix fix the ideas. Um, but we can do this uh, with a, a table as well. So um, I, I'm showing here uh, our break even basis for for every every month. And then we can kind of fill in with what the the basis is to see if we're uh, above or below. So this is like, exactly the same information as um, in the video you just saw, um, just kind of not in a graph, just just in a table. Um, and so we can see, um, you know, when we get here to, to March, our basis is the break-even basis. Um, that's where we're sort of uh, on the fence, and we might think about lifting that hedge. Um, we're lifting it on some bushels, but maybe not all. Um, you know, if you're way above the break-even basis, uh, that's definitely a time to get your get your bushels out of the hedge. Um, so we've talked a lot about hedging um, and kind of when I've been talking about it, we've sort of been assuming that you're, you're hedging on a, a futures contract, um, that you're actually kind of buying and selling these contracts. Um, and so that, that requires um, some setup. Um, I'm gonna talk, uh, all, of, all of next week is gonna be about tools where you kind of don't need a hedging account that you can do with your local elevator. Um, but if you did want to set up a hedging account, um, there's there's some considerations. Um, so if Jim Hilker was here, uh, he would tell you kind of when you get above, when you're marketing more than 100,000 bushels, that's when it really starts to make sense to think about setting this up, um, you know, ju just in case. Maybe you don't use it, um, but it's good to have that option um, to sell your sell your grain there if you need it. Um, so you can, you have to decide on a brokerage firm. So there's um, kind of online firms for a discount uh, where you kind of don't have a specific person that you're working with um, or kind of a, a, a firm with more fees where you're going to have someone kind of dedicated to you. Um, and then the paperwork to establish that you kind of have enough assets to take these. So these are, these are rich, risky markets. You can, you can lose a lot of money. Um, so you have to have the paperwork documenting that kind of you have the funds um, to get in this market. Um, and so important to remember that the minimum contract size is 5,000 bushels. So you want to be marketing enough grain that it makes sense to kind of be dealing with 5,000 bushel chunks. Um, and the downside that I'm not going to talk about today is these margin calls. So kind of if you, depending on what prices are doing, um, they might say, hey, you need to pay kind of some of this money um, so that you're kind of not on the hook for, um, for all of it if, if it turns out to be a loss. Um, so that's that's the downside, and that's where if you kind of work with a hedge to arrive, uh, which we're going to talk about a ton next week. I'm not going to get to it tonight, but I'm going to talk about it um, quite a bit next week. Um, that's where kind of the elevator can work with the margin calls, um, and so then that is not a consideration for you. So, um, but if you do decide to set up a hedging account, um, kind of these are the, the the first sort of things to be thinking about. Um, 
So I'm going to, I'm going to skip these. I, I will come back to hedge to arrives next week and we will cover them in, in great detail, but I don't want to kind of bite them off right now because we're kind of getting towards the end of the night. So we've been talking about locking in a, a futures price. Um, and then, you know, what if we lock in futures and basis simultaneously? Well, that's a, that's a cash sale or a forward contract. Um, so that's where we're locking in both the futures and the basis at the same time. So that, this gets back to a point I was making earlier in the night, um, which is when you use these tools, you're, uh, when you're using cash sales or a forward contract, you're making two decisions. You're saying, I like the futures price and I like the basis that I'm getting. So you never just go and say, hey, the, the cash price is great. I, I'm going to sell. Um, you look at the futures price, you look at the basis um, because you don't have to to pick these up at the same time. You don't have to lock them in at the same time. You have that flexibility um, as someone who's marketing grain. Um, and next week we'll talk about kind of when these tools are the right choice, when a hedge is the right choice. I um, mean, we'll, we'll look into kind of all the, the different possibilities with futures going up, futures going down, basic strengthening, basis weakening, um, kind of all the options and what tools you look to um, in each of those possibilities. Um, so, uh, to review a little bit, uh, this is kind of our, our, our main equation. Um, so the futures price is the world price. This is reflecting world supply and demand. And the basis is what's depending on local factors. Um, and so I, I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but the kind of the key insight of grain marketing, I, I think, is that you, you can lock these in at different times. So this, you have this flexibility that you don't have just always selling in the cash market. Um, and when you're in a hedge, You've locked in your futures price, but you still have the basis risk. So I have to thank Roger. He's been doing a really heroic job um, <laughs> going through the, the questions. We'll make sure, I, I hope that we can get a log of the Q&A to send out afterwards so that kind of everyone can, can read through and maybe benefit from uh, the questions that others have asked. Um, and now we have just a few minutes left if there's um, last questions that you can um, put in the Q&A. Um, or if you would kind of like to, to unmute, um, if it's a more nuanced question, um, we can possibly allow that as well. But it, um, probably typing in the Q&A is easiest. Yeah, the questions that have been in the Q&A, we will be able to send out the answers to so everyone can see those and look over them before next week. And then if anyone does have any further questions, the Q&A or the chat function right now is the best option. And then there also is an ending poll up on your screen if you don't mind taking that before you sign off today. Uh, just get your feedback on the session today. I don't see any other questions that have come in so far, Matt, but I don't know if you wanna hang on for just a few more minutes and see if anything else comes in. Uh, yeah, sure, we can, we can hang on. And then also just, just a reminder that um, feel free to email with questions. Um, so, you know, I might, I might send you back just a, a, a terse note saying, hey, hang on, um, you know, wait, we're gonna cover that next week. Um, but uh that's yeah or i might give a kind of a more a more thorough answer um so um don't take it personally <laughs> if i say you know we're not there yet but it's coming it looks like a few more questions have come in, in the q a is buy and sell the same as puts and calls um so no, we're gonna talk about puts and calls um, possibly in week three, um, but those are, are not quite the same. Although they do, you know, they do take advantage of the same existence of a futures market. Um, so they're, they're related, um, but they're not, not the same. Uh, how did you get the next expected price of 508 on the hedge table? Oh man, um, <laughs> I am going to have to go back and look at the example. It's not fresh in my head. That was a few videos back. Um, but I will, hopefully I can have the, the email of, um, and I will, I will send an email with a, a brief explanation. Um, how do you lock in basis? Uh, this is a great question. And we're going to talk about it um, a lot uh, next week. So, you know, one option is a, a basis contract. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the end, I mean, one way that you lock in basis is to sell cash. I mean, that's, you've locked in the futures and you've locked in your basis. Um, a basis contract is going to allow you to lock in basis and then kind of see what happens with the futures market. Um, so we'll talk about that. Um, yeah, we'll talk about basis contracts for sure next week, uh, as well as hedge to arrives.
All right. Um, yeah, if there's no more questions, uh, that's all I have for tonight. Um, so, oh, is there negotiations available when setting up a hedge? Um, so if you're, you're buying a, a, a futures contract um, kind of from the exchange, um, definitely not. That's kind of the advantage of an exchange is that there's no need to negotiate over bushels. There's no need to negotiate over where delivery is. All of that is set. And so it just is the price. So if, if you're buying a futures contract, um, no, there's really not room for negotiation. Um, but we'll see uh, when you kind of are, are going to your local elevator, um, you know, these, these same principles of futures and bases are applying, but there, there often will be opportunities uh, to negotiate. And there often will be opportunities to market. You know, there's certainly opportunities to come up with a contract um, that doesn't have, you know, 5,000 bushels, where you can kind of negotiate a price depending on how much you have to market. Um, so, so no is the short answer for a futures exchange, but um, ne negotiation it is something that potentially happens um, with your local elevator. All right, I have I have nine o'clock. Um, so yeah, hopefully people got some value out of it, and um, yeah, look forward to seeing you all uh, next week.